And now I see my father in my face, in our eyes, wide apart. And now I see my father in my brow, blood in the temple beating in, and our hair in retreat. Now I see my father in my mouth, lips failing to form the sound sometimes. Now I see my father in my stare, held still while the world turns around. And now I see my father in my fingers, dripping ink, burning like a cigarette and dropping ash, he tapping. And I see my father in my selfishness, all others left behind, headstrong to find a missing piece. Finding that I know this. that I see my dad in my loneliness. Oh, Lord. That was a poem called Heredity. How are you doing? Thank you for joining me in this continuous elongated strangeness. I hope you're well, I hope things are good for you there. I hope you're getting by. So I've got a bunch of poems. Um, wasn't sure what to read. Still not sure what order to read them in, but I got a better idea than I did have. And I'm gonna continue on that theme of that first one that touches on um, well, loneliness, solitude, isolation. I'm called Bully in Solitude. Solitude. Dear involuntary friend. I fear you shall ne'er be rid of me. Perhaps I bully you. With my insistent presence, China shop silence acclimatizing. If you feel this intrusion as brutally, why do you not fight back? Passive solitude. Fake similitude. When I walk into you, full body slam, send you sprawling, talk over you, blame you, bawling and throwing punches at your shoulder, clipping at your ears, throw me out. Throw me out of isolation. Bad behaviour should warrant such rescinding of privileges. But you know me, solitary. I will be back for you, dear involuntary friend. Oh, <laughs> I fear you shall ne'er be rid of me, repeat offender. Strange to say, perhaps it's strange to say, that isolation and solitude has been with me since I can remember. It may well be true to say that of you as well. I would not be surprised. The sense of communion we may attain with another, so fleeting. 
hardly knowing whether it was how total it was. Always something unsaid. This one I wrote, most of these I wrote, but this one in particular I wrote, when all the full gamut and all the options possible for human interaction were still available to us. And I wonder, maybe it will be different when we go back and reclaim it. It's called Cross the Road. The astonishing agony of loneliness can be a jealous one. Where were you when I walked the cold road? You have already missed so much. Do you think these seeds of hope will warm beneath so slight a touch? Or mistrustful? What was not here before will be gone hereafter. What was left unseen within a crowd will find no other home. What of me you must believe before I give you leave to stay is this injury and throat constricting rust. But the truth is, we give a smile from our side of the street. Say so you needn't cross over. Keep away, even. It's for the best. I have, I've not bathed for a week. That's a good reason not to get too close. Besides, I'm only half dressed. And the old man finds there is no wall to lean upon. When the child no other eye to share the brilliant sky. And the broad back finds no hand shaped push to ease the overarch. It is a shower of thorns we must raise our torn umbrellas to. And the need of another lonely soul might be the only thing to see us freed. I hope that doesn't sound too despairing. It's so easy to, um, the song of the Lord, living in silence, living in solitude when There's no one else around to define you. And it's as if you become invisible to yourself. But also far more visible to yourself. And all those little things, those worries and hurts and injustices and griefs that you wouldn't dream of airing in a world full of greater tragedies than your own become kind of all-encompassing. And that's not to say that you shouldn't own up to them. Without that comparison of other people's importance, perhaps it's time to give them space and say, yeah, I own you too, small as you are in comparison to the world, but huge as they are to me on my own. One more, and then I'm going to introduce my special guest. A poem called Never Asked. Never asked for shelter before now. I always had my skin. Always had my bone. Always had the cleverness of thought. Always had. Always had the receding tide further than your reach, way beyond further than the touch, never part of time, too far for the connect of your fist, of your kissing fist, 
too far for me to punch back. Rain flowing off me like a duck quack. Raining blows always had my skin. Never asked for shelter from myself. I was already in. I was all ready with my bone, already with the quietness of thought, already. Already leaping into waves, crashing in the corner on the beach, waves from beyond a loneliness of touch, never part of anything deep in the connect of what was missed in the past. Mist floating down with a crunch, black rain drying on me like a whip crack, lashing down, I already in. Never did. Now, I ask for shelter now in braille never shown to the blind fist reading for the deaf now that i swim in rain with my skin peeling back receding because now i would rather take the blow than the void now i would rather trade the silence for some noise. Now I would have the sea inside raining on my back and your hand on my skin to keep a warm patch steady, constant, always within reach. Never asked. So, my friend, for a change of voice and to make these sessions not just about me, I've been reading from the published works of people I know, much to their surprise. I haven't tipped them in a wink or anything. I've been choosing from the pile of friends' publications and reading a couple and today I want to read from the book published by my friend Tom Bland. That's the one there, The Death of a Clown. As it happens, also published by Bad Betty Press. I seem to be reading from a number of theirs. Very good though they are. And the first by Tom I want to read is the first in the book. But two short ones and then one slightly longer. Begin, it's the poem that begins, you reminded me. This is a short one. You reminded me of my old boss. A sexologist who snorted coke and undressed in front of me in the kitchen then ran into the street, knocking off a policeman's helmet. Why is ritual so important? In a second. I promise to love you. Tracy Emin writes in a heart. It isn't a real heart. It doesn't even look like a real one. Electric neon. The first sketch drawn in black ink on a sheet of textured paper and then... A burst of red light. In the workshop in Bethnal Green. It isn't a real heart. It doesn't even... That time, I had a pig's heart in my mouth, running around the stage at the roundhouse. It tasted of sick.
And this third, because those two are so short, this one's slightly longer. This poem that begins once a year. Once a year, the Guardian has the headline in their ever-shrinking culture section. Autobiography is dead. One day soon, when language and experience have finally reached their divorce settlement, words will only be words. Oh shit, does that mean poetry is dead too? My friend said, almost breaking one of his teeth, opening Weston's old rosy, which he poured into a glass of brandy and brown sugar to kill memory, any memory. You can't experience anything with memory holding you back, he said, spitting out the lid. I was standing outside a Dalston club when a woman in a monochrome dress asked me what my greatest achievement was to date. I replied, learning to speak. I was born constricted with the umbilical twisted around my neck and torso, born dead, oxygen, brain activity, electrical language, terminated for a pinpoint second. My mouth, my brain, connection disjointed. As a child, I only spoke to myself in my head. Only I knew what I meant. I had to learn how to say things, sounds into words, actual words others understood. About a year ago, I found myself snorting lines of coke, but I hated doing it with other people, only alone. Blue in the face, breathing blue, heart racing, near heart attack. Was this orgasm? Was I even hard? I loved the intensity of being on my own. My adrenaline-induced out-of-body, looking back at my pulsating limbs, that self-aware speck, jittering or jumping between the two, like being dead slash born again. Ranting so fast, all my words blurred into rapid hand gestures, the very shapes of my early tongue-tied jabbering. Outside the Dalston Club, she blew a smoke ring, throwing the butt on the floor, I took a long drag of my own cig. You speak okay now, though, she said, rubbing her head. Tom is a lovely bloke, and if you do get a chance to see him perform, he performed quite readily around London. That's where I met him on the poetry circuit. And that's his book, The Death of a Clown, published by Bad Betty. And I think I've detected some overlap in some of the themes of what I've chose with what was his there. So, it's two or three about, I might echo some of the things Tom said in his. The world. Every night there's an awkward conversation with the world I'd rather not have. Are you awake, Math? Can we talk? It's as if the world's smooth so you can't keep from falling off. Digging nails into the mattress, hanging like a dali in the sky. 
rolling down the hill into your heart again. Why do you try to leave, Math? Where do you go every night? The world sleep paralysed, and I become the danger on the bed. I become the loud thing, reverberating. Children get taught not to see the other world, don't they? But even that sounds safer than it is. Go to sleep then, Matt. It'll be better in the morning. If only I could round it off like I might. All night time, all sleep, eh? <laughs> I can't say I had the same troubles as, as Tom talks about in learning to speak. But it was certainly the case that I would go days, I think, if I remember right, of not saying a word, returning up at a friend's house, being let in by his kind mum and just sitting playing with their toys listening to their warm and energetic family, their together family, and then strolling out, not having said a word to anybody. And my son as well, he's very slow to speech too. That might be relevant to this one called well-meaning. Speaking in a language no one ever knew. Are we sure the words we're using mean the things we use them for? When every agreed meaning is a hand to pull us from the sea, our boat or another's, we're still not sure. All that time beneath the surface, I didn't use breath. Just the throbbing in my neck. I think the fishes understood. But the mouthing I see now. I'm making sounds, moving my lips around, still not sure I want to lose the water from my lungs. Take the air. sound sometimes becomes incredibly important in my sleep those dreams when you feel the presence in your room and you want to wake but you can't wake and you can't move because you're asleep and you know you can't move and that's part of the fear I find myself trying to make a noise whether that's to wake me up or to warn me in the dream or to warn me in the wake or to shout for somebody else. And after such a time, I wrote this one called Ah. Sound is the only thing going to save you. Because the story so far didn't use it. Breath is the one who wants, it wants to stifle out. And it's sitting on your limbs through the morning. Sound is the only thing going to help you, though it's drowning in your lungs of the weight on a wire tied around his ankles. Watch it sinking down, try to make a noise. Sound is the only thing you have if you wrestle the paralysis and will, if you can just will the lips to open, if you can just burst the blister, form the fear, the sound within your dream in do your sleeping mouth, snatch a breath, make it scream, wake up! Ah! Ah! Waking up less fevered. Dreams have been a journey. Flailing in the cool dark, am I still in fairy? Weight has settled on the ground, was it me or Mary? 
Is there time for a heartbeat now? The music in my memory. She played a wicked fiddle, and he was fine and hairy. They had arms that held. The room was fast and bleary. Fatigue in my muscles now. The pinch leaves me teary, waking up less fevered and less so lonely. The dawn I've missed these last nights. The light may sting me. I hear the sound of hooves now. Someone late upon their journey. I still wrapped in dew and sweat. Will they deny me a face of beard and horn, a voice still raspy, a hand to grip my chin? Do you not know me? Here upon this further edge, your dreams have been a journey. Come and run the ragged way, your wild legs beneath ye. The town has sleepy lights still, has no welcome for thee. Is there time for a heartbeat now? The music in my memory. She played a wicked fiddle, and he was fine and hairy. I close my heart within my chest. Recommence my journey. Moment of waking. Three more till we're done. I wonder if I can tell who's out there. Most often I can't. Sometimes it gives me a clue. Someone sends a message and that's always nice. Can't see anything at the moment. My gizmos are very unsatisfactory gizmos. I thought I had something there, but let's go back to the three. Saz, mm, hello, and Heather maybe, you're there. <laughs> okay. Three to finish, and three inspired by the story of the Minotaur. Some touches of the Minotaur about them. First is called Minotaur. Sister Ariadne knows me. Shadow in the shadowed hall. Brooding, heavy head. Moon tipped and red in fur. You might be one of seven. Sent in sacrifice. Man or maid, or else a king distressed in palace held above the maze. The darkness shifts. You know it no longer emptiness. A scuff of hoof to stir the blood beneath the bruise. The dust of matted hide, disgust upon the air and in your nose. The passage holds a fullness now. The form impending. You have it there beneath the ribs, slicking in your breath. And you might never dare go deep again. Never sit, but if you run, you'll run as a rat. Urine spilling, and that inside, to breathe your best, will be to test the size of your scream. No throat was ever made to hold that bellow. But still, there is gorge clumping through the dark hollow, stored and finding voice. Step by step and twist of yarn, set it straight. Set a labyrinth about me. You will never, ever escape. Asleep with my brother, in amongst his labyrinthine curls, and the warm steam of his wheezing, 
playing on my nape. I dream of your arrival. I will lead you past him with subtle wool. Your fingers will be fine enough. Keep yourself low where his horn of gold will not reach you. And I will say farewell to this bellow, to this belly. You will have no smell next to him, nor hair. And your feet will tread so softly, oh, so softly, come soon, come. Asleep with my sister, a rare thing and a rare thing. I'd hardly feel such a flicker, spinning fingers playing in my down, but this is my sister. And every flea leap of warmth, well, it resounds like the fire held in the Greek's hands, dances through my caves, a singed thread upon the cold air, and the smell. An appetite to prevent one incursion, and a hunger to invite another. Warm fingers play ripples in, ripples in beneath my skin, softly, oh, so softly. Stay long, stay. The maze holds me. Some dance where others stray. Seven of each kind sent in tribute. One will set me free. The cavern widened like a dull tear yawning, and I fell in re-entry. Wings burning to air showed a shadow on the cave wall, hair matted. Like a hand stiff cracked from carrying, I was opened. Damp on the ground, lacking knees, sword fallen. Thick breath clamped across my mouth and silenced. No outlet for this breaking spirit. Bones and thighs scattered, no place on the earth sent to die in a labyrinth. No priestess this time clutching fire, turning it to strings. I felt the bull legs prizing stiff beneath my own. I took the bull's cock spear between my ribs, prick to the heart. I had the tongue of the bull. I was pulling on the horn, drawing him in, venting him out, kiss on my lips, throat in my tongue in my throat, vomiting the truth. Beyond this life there is only death. A damp rag of cum thrown into a corner. Stomach acid, gut juice spilt, bladder burst, labyrinth thrown open, lying as a dead thing in the rancid blood of a minotaur. Dawn rises in the eye, in the dark. Life is noticed in the lifting of the chest, blood slipping even so through the flesh, and the iron resolute spark inherent. Felt the cavern walls like the edges of thought, existence found in the spaces of the passages. Progress made in scraped knees, jarred head. Perhaps there is no way out. 
the thread found in retrospect. Silent call of spun yarn, Ariadne, the one who drew me on. Before the light defines, the cave is put to bed. Only for those tasted the boar's head. Thanks very much for listening. Keep well. God's bless.